Uh, hi everybody, this is Alan Peterson with uh, Meet the Thriller Author, and I'm very excited to introduce a very special guest today. I have Russell Blake, who's a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of dozens of thrillers and mystery novels, action-adventure, uh, including the Jet and the Assassin series, and he's also co-authored novels with the uh, legendary Clive Cussler, and he's joining us here today. Russell, thanks so much for coming on the show. Glad to be here, Alan. How are you doing? You know, I, I really can't complain. I mean, I do constantly, but <laughs> I, I can't. I shouldn't. So for listeners who aren't familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. I'm an author. I live in Mexico, and I have now for about 15 years. I started self-publishing in June of 2011, and since then I've written, I want to say, 47 or 48 novels, and two of which were with uh, Clive Cussler. I'm mainly action, adventure, and mystery. Typically turn out, you know, six to nine books a year, like clockwork. That's amazing. Uh, you're so prolific. You're like a legend in the <laughs> in the business uh, for your for uh, uh, <laughs> or no, notorious. <laughs> it's not the same as legendary, but I'll take it. All right, yeah, let, let's go legendary and notorious. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that's just uh, that's just amazing. That's just incredible. I, I've been following your your advice or trying to follow your advice and uh, on, on how to do that. What decided to make you try to write your uh, a novel, and why did you choose thrillers? You know, uh, that's what I read. You know, when I'm not reading, uh, when I'm not reading nonfiction, and I found myself, you know, gravitating to the Ludlum. I grew up on Ludlum and Cussler and that sort of thing. So, you know, when I, I decided to try my hand at it, Tom Harris was another one that I really liked. When I, I decided to try my hand at it and um, self-publish, I just I just wrote what I, I personally would want to read. So, yeah, that way I figured if nobody bought it, at least I would have entertained myself. Yeah, at least you had fun with it, right? Yeah, exactly, because the odds say that you're not going to, you know, that nobody else is going to read it anyway, so you might as well write what you want to write. And were you writing a lot before, uh, have you like always been writing before you even decided to try to publish? Yeah, no, I, I, I probably threw away hmm, six to eight finished novels um, oh. before I wrote the one that I, I published in, in, in June of 2011, because they just weren't very good. So, but, you know, I, I, I decided my own amusement, as I said, you know, when I had time. And, you know, sometimes I had periods of time for two, three months where I wouldn't be doing much of anything and looking for something to do. So I would write something and then read it a year later and it sucked and I'd throw it away. And I'm glad I did. I, I'm glad I didn't inflict any of that on the world. <laughs> no plans. That they'll, they'll never make the, the, the light of day. You haven't gone back to check no, the... No, 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 they're gone. I mean, oh. they're... They're, <laughs> they're gone, and the world's better for it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, where do you get your ideas for your books? They're, they're so amazing, the, all the different uh, uh, series that you have going. Uh, where do you get, where do you get those all these ideas? Well, Alan, most of it's, you know, fueled by booze and dope, but um, <laughs> I also follow the news. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you know, take mean, tequila uh, shots. Huh? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. No, I, I really, I just, I, I follow the news, and you know what? I, I just, my main challenge is to, is to temper reality to the point where it, it is plausible. So, I mean, any day I can, I can watch, I, I, I can look through the headlines and find at least five to ten pretty active and obvious conspiracy theories or lies that are being foisted off on the public. So, so I just, you know, it, it's pretty easy for me to, to, <laughs> to find subject matter. Yeah, I remember there's an interview that uh, Charlie Rose was interviewing John Grisham, and he asked him about where he gets his ideas. It goes, I steal them from the news. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. cool. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it sure beats it beats working. I mean, you know, it's, otherwise it's not like I sit around all day going hmm. hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do that. So when you get an idea, do you like jot it down and like save it for later if you're already working on something or? Nah, you know, I I just trust that I'm going to have more you know more ideas as, as I go. If I come up with an idea and it's a decent one, I just start writing it. You know, I outline it and then uh, you know put it aside and and then write it. And uh, do, do you do you find like movies and television, pop culture, do they influence your your novels? You know, I not really. I, I don't own a TV, and I probably haven't seen a movie in ten years. Oh wow, so that's a big no. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, maybe I was influenced by 24 or something back, <laughs> <laughs> back when, during the gaslight days, but yeah. no, not not. Not recently. I'm sure I've missed a lot of great stuff too. But well, what are you gonna do? Oh, yeah, you've been very busy too. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, and uh, do you ever find like a experience, like your own experiences? Do they ever make it into your into your novels? Like, uh, is it a little bit about your personality and any of your characters? Oh sure, sure. I think that all of the characters have different you know aspects of my personality, decision making, you know, an evil sense of humor, a cynical sort of pragmatic world view um yeah i like to write characters that are that are plausible and are plausible because they're complicated they're neither you know all good nor all bad there's a lot of um contradictions inherent and i think that's what makes characters interesting is the struggle between you know what they should do what they want to do what they shouldn't do yeah that that that, because people are generally not all good or all bad i mean even hitler loved his dog so it, it, it's you know if you can if you can encapsulate and capture some of that that complexity in, in characters, I find they're more interesting. It makes books more interesting. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read several of your books in, in your different series, and uh, I always when reading Black, I kind of think I'm like, oh, I bet that's more like uh, like Russell. The, 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 the oh black yeah, thing. no, I have a really evil. You know, I, I'd say I'm more like Roxy than I am <laughs> Black, but I. It, <laughs> I mean, th- th- let me put it this way: those are very easy and fast for me to write. <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of heavy lifting in terms of imagination on those. So that's my inner dialogue. Is it uh, more challenging to write when you're writing as a female character versus the male protagonist? I thought it would be, but it, no, it hasn't been. Like you know, I, I, I've written what twelve Jet books, and I wrote the 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 young adult, you know, sort of romance series, and. Um, the first book that I actually published was Fatal Exchange came, you know, really featured a female protagonist. So, um, no, I think I'm just really in touch with my feminine side. I, whatever. I, it's, it's, it doesn't matter to me whether it's male or female. And what are some of the challenges that you, that, that you encounter when you're writing? If you, if you, if you encounter any, cause you're so prolific. <laughs> Well, I, no, I, the biggest challenge I find these days is, you know, I, I'm just constantly living in fear that I've already written it. That I've already, you know, done that scene, or you know, I've I've made that point before. So I'm just now afraid of repeating myself more than anything. But um, I, I'd say the biggest hardship I, I had was was physical. You know, from from just sitting for ten, twelve hours at a time. You know, once I got my my treadmill desk, that 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 was mitigated. But I mean, I was starting to, you know, I was starting to jokingly say, "You're not really a writer if you can still feel your feet." Well, <laughs> there's there's some truth to that, and it's an unfortunate truth. So that my biggest hurdles were more physical than than mental or intellectual. So the, yeah, and that's uh, something that um, I find fascinating with the with the treadmill desk. That was the first time I really ever even heard of that was uh, when I, I think it was in your, on the blog post or on a forum or something, you had mentioned it. Not to scare people, the listeners away, but could you describe like a, a writing day for you? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I get up, you know, I, I try to be writing usually by 8.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, I'll go out and grab a cup of coffee and then come back and think about what I'm going to do. And then I start writing, you know, at 9 o'clock and I'll, I'll, I'll keep going until maybe... You know, it's lunchtime and grab some tacos or whatever and then keep going until dinner. And if I haven't hit my word count, keep going until whenever it takes to get to the word count. If it takes till midnight, then I go till midnight. If I'm able to hit my word count by by 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, I'm done. And do you write every day? Oh, yeah. No, when I'm in a, no- when I'm in a novel, I, there's no other way I can do it. I've tried, I've tried doing stuff sensible chunks and it just doesn't work for me I, I have to stay fully immersed in the novel um until i'm done so i'll, I'll put in 10 12 hour days when i'm writing a novel and what's your process do you uh, do you do like a lot of outlining or do you like kind of go as you go along or no I, I i've tried it all all possible ways and i found the most efficient is outlining it because basically you know people people that say oh no i can't outline my pants i mean i get that i've done it and the only difference is you know it's the same brain processing the same story 
and you know trying to figure out where the plot's going to go it's just a, an issue of sequence it's when you're doing the figuring so i find it's just more efficient to commit 3 or 4 days or however long it takes to really thinking through the plot and outlining it rather than you know doing it as i go along i can do it as i go along too it's just it takes me two to three times longer to finish a book if i do it that way so I'd rather just outline it. I, I like to say it's like, you know, if you're in L.A. and you want to get to New York, it's a lot easier if you got a map. So, you know, get the map first. Yeah, especially with the pressure, well, not pressure, but like the expectation in the uh, for indie writers to publish multiple titles in a year, I would imagine that it would be kind of hard if you're just always pantsing it. But I know some people do it, but it's, it would just be... I think it's, like it depends tough. on the genre. Mm-hmm. I think it's a genre. Like if I was writing romance, like I didn't, I didn't outline my my young adult stuff, the romance stuff. I just, you know, I mean that I was writing. Oh, I want to say I was doing ten to twelve thousand words a day because wow. it was, you know, first person, present tense. It's all about, you know, how everyone feels and you know, push and pull of of the personalities and their, their evolution of the romance. So there's not a lot of plot. So you don't have to worry about you know the 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 tertiary and fourth subplots you know dovetailing at some point by the third act. I mean that just isn't there. So so you can just sort of do it more free form. So that's not to diss romance or young adult. It's just it's a different you know it's it's kind of the difference between sitting down with a piece of music for a symphony versus winging it on a guitar. Yeah, especially with thrillers because it's. Uh, um you know the weapons research, all that stuff that we we would get nailed for if we get wrong. I would imagine you know it's a lot more more of that type of detail than a, a, in writing thrillers. Oh yeah, no. In fact, my my latest one that I'm going to be releasing in, in what February 26. Um, I actually had a, a couple of of working cops, you know, beta read it just to check it for um, whether I screwed anything up. In the in the process, because there's a lot of police work involved in in the book, so I didn't want to I didn't want to make any gaffes and get something obviously wrong. So um, yeah, there's 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 some research, and I, I do advise using beta readers if you can find beta readers who are you know if you're writing I don't know prepper fiction, find somebody that's a prepper that really loves guns that knows all about it to to, to beta read for you so that you you know you, you don't make any obvious mistakes. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Instead of just finding a beta reader, find one with a specific knowledge of uh, of what you're writing about. Huh. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I wrote my bio thriller about, you know, the lab um, origins of HIV, I found one of the foremost experts on bioweapons and lab-generated retroviruses and who, who I consulted and who read it and corrected some stuff for me. So, so nah, you, you know, find somebody that knows more than you do about the subject matter and then have them read it. And the one that's coming up on the 26th of February, is that, a, is that an existing series or something new? Yeah, it, well, actually, the, it's funny because the very first book I ever wrote was called Fatal Exchange, mm-hmm. and it was set in New York, and it was, you know, f- somebody's killing the female bike messengers. That was the, the overall, uh, that was a sort of quick snapshot summary of the, the plot. And then the subplot was, and the the uh, a foreign government is counterfeiting $100 bills, and, you know, they're, they're in New York trying to get a briefcase that was smuggled out of the country back before Treasury can figure out that somebody's basically minting almost perfect hundred dollar bills. So that was my first published novel what four and a half years ago. This is going to be the second book in that series, and I've had the outline sitting on my freaking desk for four years. <laughs> I really have. I've, I've had it sitting here, and I've stared at it with guilt every day <laughs> for four years. <laughs> yeah, for four years, and, and you know, it's just a piece of paper. But but you know, now it's yellow, and it's kind of crumbling <laughs> around the edges, and it looks like the Declaration of Independence. And you know, I'm like, God, are you ever going to write this? And I so I just sort of forced myself to sit down and and and, and write it. That's that's exciting because because uh, yeah, I, I I think that's one of the first books I've read. Right, I read. Oh, even before I even found out, because you know I was you were popping up on all my uh, also bots way back when, <laughs> and uh, right. that's what I think that was one of the first one, and the one with uh, Silver with the FBI agent. 
Yeah, Silver Justice. That was, yeah, a couple of years later. I was trying to explain in layman's terms what actually happened in the 2008 financial crisis versus the mainstream media sort of spin on what happened. Mm-hmm. So I decided to cloak that in fiction and kind of um, cloak it as a, a, a murder mystery. Yeah, and I was reading on your, on your blog post that you said you did a, you, you rewrote um, the, uh, the, uh, the fatal, uh, fatal ex- exchange. And right. So the, how, how does that work? Do you like this, just this decided, oh, I'm going to re- rewrite it, or you started rewriting it, and next thing you knew it Well, was- I, you know, I couldn't really remember that much about it, because, you know, with 40-something books in between, I was like, geez, what, I vaguely remember it, but I, you know, I, I, I really don't remember it. So I, I went back and read it over a couple of days, and I went, this, you know, this could use some real help. I mean, so so I just I, after I, I finished Fatal Deception, the, the sequel, I, I just went back through and and polished it up. Just did a, a rewrite and an edit. Probably killed about three thousand words that should have never been there in the first place, and eliminated a lot of echoes. And you know, because over time you get better at some of the craft stuff. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's kind of painful to read something that you first wrote. <laughs> 40 novels later because it's like oh boy you know a lot of it's good but some of it's just grown out loud so I tried to eliminate the groaning sections yeah that's something I've always been very impressed with when like you always like are experimenting you're like changing your book covers um you, you, yeah, you like you're not just like this kind of like sitting on your on the success it seems like you're always tweaking things how does what's what's the process in that I mean, well, it's just coming from from a background of being an entrepreneur. You're either shrinking or growing. I mean, so you you have to always be be looking to to improve your offering, or somebody is right behind you and will figure out a better way to do it. So I'm just sort of you know I'm constantly trying to improve the offering, and if that means rewriting stuff, I'll go back and rewrite. If it means that I dislike a a, a cover, I will you know change the cover until it's something that clicks. It's just you know this that's the business side of it. So you know and in a business, it's a retail business. It's like well, why does Coke advertise? Why does you know why 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 do do car companies change their models every six or seven years, even if they've got a success? It's because you're constantly driven to improve the offering so that you can improve your sales. Yeah, somebody said if if it, if it only if advertising only worked once, then nobody would keep advertising. <laughs> Yeah, it's like going. It's like going to the gym. You don't just go once and you know lift some barbells and okay, that's it. Did my job. Woo. Uh, <laughs> where's the Where's the Cuervo? Because because I'd be all over that. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. So you, you have to. You know, you signed up for a job. I mean, I wrote a blog like that a while ago. It's like this is not a a. You know, it's a job. It's a great job, but it's a job. If you're successful enough at it to make a living at it, you have signed up to to a job. So just resign yourself to doing the job every day just like you would if you were working for someone else yeah your blog is uh is i, I think it's like a must for uh, aspiring writers or or even established writers um because you offer a lot of uh, advice on the industry and uh pulling no punches which is uh i think is what we all need really a lot of people <laughs> hate me for that i mean seriously a lot of people hate me it's like oh you crushed my dreams it's like well look would you rather know how things are or would you rather you know somebody tell you that it's all unicorns and marshmallow clouds and you know i mean magical thinking i mean to me it's it's it does the the author community a disservice to paint things differently than reality Mm -hmm. that's not to say you have to be pessimistic or negative but it just means that look it's this is not easy and the odds are against you so just recognize that get over it you know and if you still want to do it recognizing you know the level of difficulty involved in succeeding then maybe you're cut out for it Mm -hmm. but don't you know don't launch into it thinking like you're going to be the next Grisham because you you cobbled together you know a, a, a who done it, and you know, yeah. <laughs> and and the world's going to take notice. That, that rarely ever happens. So. Well, yeah, and even like the big names like like that, like Grisham back in the day. I mean, he like had to grab all the books himself, put them in his trunk of his car, and kind of went Dude, on and the, the road. Man could write. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the man could write his ass off. If you've ever read, you know, uh, what is it, A Time to Kill, mm-hmm. his first published novel. I mean, it was great. 
So, so, so I'm pretty sure that's not the first thing he ever wrote. Let me put it that way. <laughs> He's, you know, and as an attorney, you're working with language yeah. and you're writing briefs and everything all the time. So, so you're you, that's you're, you're swimming with the fishes at that point. But he was he, he was brilliant, and there's a lot of guys like that. There, that's your competition. Yeah, and especially with the, in self-publishing, things change so much. I mean, what was a reality in 2012 is not even close to what it is today, huh? and that keeps changing, huh? <laughs> no, and I, I knew that at the time. I remember I look back at blogs of mine from 2012 and 2013 where I'm going, these are the good old days. Like, we're in it right now. It's never going to get better than now. And I knew it. I mean, I was just like, this cannot, this is unsustainable. So yeah, we were on a parabolic growth with device um, acceptance. The technology was, you know, all shiny and new and glittery, and people were excited by it. Reading became kind of hip again with a certain subculture, and you know there was a buzz about it. And and there was, you know, Amazon had and Apple had just intermediated the uh, traditional supply chain, so they were able to. You know, it was exciting because you didn't have to go through a gatekeeper in New York. So, you know, I just knew this couldn't last. You know, and it didn't. I mean, you know, millions of authors issued forth their their work. Much of it terrible. Some of it great. Um, you know, readers stopped being all that. It wasn't quite as exciting that you know, wow, I can get a book cheap or free. You know, it's like there's millions of them now. And the technology was like, yeah, I'm on my third Kindle. Yeah, so, 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 so we're now in a mature marketplace, and mature markets are much harder to break into. I mean, they just are. Yeah, we were competing now with the big publishing houses because even then, some of them have adopted, you know, the promos, the book bub type stuff, the the lower pricing. Yeah, I, they, I, but the, the the traditional houses, you know, the traditional houses really have no frigging idea what they're doing in terms of, of the the business um, from a marketing end uh, um, for Kindle and for the e platform. I mean, if they did, they would have been ahead of Amazon by ten years, and they yeah. could have been. Shame on them. So they, they just, you know, they, they're technophobic in, in, in a lot of ways. So that is one of our advantages is that we're much faster to move to spot trends, to be able to write to trend if we want to, and to, you know, vary our approach. And we're not trying to protect our paper profits. So we're not, we're pricing to shift units. We're not pricing to protect other products that are in different markets. So we have some tremendous advantages still. And uh, do you still uh, uh, generate, uh, publish uh, print editions from your books? I do. I mean, you know, I, I put stuff out through CreateSpace, but it's not really a big part of my, um, it's not a big part of my portfolio. I mean, I won't say it's an afterthought, but it's as close to one as you can get. <laughs> And what about audio The reason is very simple. Most people, most people have e-readers that are in my, in my crowd. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And what about audiobooks? Are, are you in that market? Yeah, no, I've yeah. done, I've, I've produced, I want to say like 18 or 19 audiobooks, and I just did a deal with ACX, um, where I'm in the process of finish finalizing a deal where they're going to do the Ramsey series. So, hmm, cool. um, you know, that, that's a viable, and it, it makes me, you know, more than beer money, so I'm happy about it. But that's also genre specific. Like, you know, some of the romance authors are killing it with audio and sci fi kills it in audio um other genres not so much mm -hmm. yeah and i think for the, th the thriller genre i think it's a little bit tougher uh especially with yeah because i mean look who's your reader yeah i mean yeah I, that, that, that's what i always tell people when they're looking at genres it's just like who is your reader and you know i mean i i recognize my reader for a conspiracy thriller or an action adventure novel is probably not a 26 year old you know um woman living in new jersey it's just not it's it's probably going to be somebody between the ages of 40 to 70 who's probably read several thousand books in the genre by then so they're going to be fairly discerning and they're you know you, you better you better raise the bar and do you still find time to read? Do you? Very rarely, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love reading, but very rarely because of my production schedule. I mean, right now I'm reading James Lee Burke's latest one, and I'm sort of getting getting through that, you know, an hour a night. 
Mm-hmm. But um, beyond that, I, I haven't I haven't really been able to read for pleasure very often because you know I finish a book and then two days later I'm I'm slated to start another one. So, yeah. but James D. Burke, so even though when you do find time to read, you're still going to thrillers <laughs> or that type. Uh, action. Yeah, well, I read Burke because I mean I don't know if you've ever read James Lee Burke. Yeah, he's I mean, amazing. You, you should. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a masterful use of prose, and you know I would read a yeah, a cookbook by him. I mean, it really it doesn't matter. It's I felt the same way about David Foster Wallace. I mean, you know he could write you know he could write you know a guide to making fishing reels, and I would would be more than happy to read it because he was just so masterful in terms of his use of prose. But there's there's very few authors like that. I mean, they really. There's very few authors that are working these days whose prose engages at that level, mm-hmm. and it's it's sad, but it's true because the market doesn't reward that. Right? Yeah, they want the the punchier, uh, shorter type. Uh... James James Patterson is the most successful author on the planet. Mm-hmm. His average book is sixty eight thousand words. Wow. His average sentence, you know, uses between six and eight words. Yeah. I mean, I'm not making that up. I'm not dissing James Patterson. I think, you know, he's a genius at what he does. But that that's what, you know, the majority of readers want. Mm-hmm. And they're voting with their wallets. So ignore that at your peril. Yeah. Now, I do ignore it at my peril, but I recognize that I'm giving up a substantial number of sales because I, I tend to try to write more, you know, for what I view as, as adult tastes. Mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not trying to capture the reality show um, you know, audience. I'm trying to 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 get a more elevated and hopefully more loyal readership. Because my theory is that if you generate stuff that everybody else could, then why buy yours versus everybody else's? Yeah. And so you got to you got to figure out what your difference, what your distinctive difference is going to be, and then sort of you know push on that. And if you're successful, good for you. You know, you, your readership will reward you. If you, if if you if you called it wrong, well, you know, you're gonna be uh, you're gonna be flipping burgers. That's... <laughs> and how do you interact with that with your with your readers? I mean, are they uh, are they very do they email a lot? Email you a lot? Are you on, are you active on Facebook? How does this... yeah? No, I get I get probably I don't know 100 150 emails a day. Wow. <laughs> I, I know it's it's just crazy sometimes. I mean, it's slowed down now, um, but oof, boy, when I release, you know, when I said I I wasn't going to do any more jet novels, I, I got hundreds <laughs> of you know f- just furious, you know, like like 80 year old cat ladies threatening to kill me, literally. <laughs> You know, how dare you? <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> and they all they all say the same thing. It's like, I just wish she would, you know, you would let them find peace, but keep writing them. Yeah, it's like, well, okay, but you know, you know, you know, Jet and Hannah go get a, a, a soft serve and, and go for a ride on a pony is not a Jet novel, <laughs> so they can't find peace. <laughs> You know, we can't have Jet be a good mommy, you know, and, you know, have a bunch of, you know, Russians with, you know, Kalashnikovs after them. It's choose one. <laughs> yeah, what the best of uh, of both worlds, I guess, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, you know, I, and then, you know, I, I routinely get the other suggestion, well, you should you should have Hannah follow in her footsteps. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah, so now now Jet's in a wheel. Chair. She's wearing Depends, and you know Hannah is out. <laughs> no, I, you know, at some point you need to let let the story just you know wind down and and hopefully give it a cathartic ending and move on. But obviously that's not going to happen with Jed because the readers have spoken. So okay. Oh, so she's 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 living. She's continuing on. Huh? Kicking ass. She's continuing on. I, I just released another one yeah. just recently, and um, it did extremely well. So I'm. I am not unhappy with the results. I, I just, you know, I thought that readers would be pretty damn sick of it by now, but apparently not. <laughs> and now, what was it like? Um, we talked about those big names. Um, you worked with, worked with uh, Clive Cussler. You yeah. co-authored a couple of books. I mean, how, that must have been a, a quite an interesting ride. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it was amazing. I, I really had to sort of pinch myself to make sure that I was, yeah, you know, that, that it was real. I mean, I couldn't believe that I, I landed that gig, frankly. 
Um, and I was very happy when I did. And I, I, it was a brilliant opportunity and sort of launched me to the next level with a, a, a lot of, certainly with the New York publishing community and um, with, with his readership. But, you know, I mean, you know, after a couple of novels with him, I think we, we, you know, we did everything that we wanted to do. And it's time for somebody else to, to pick up that gauntlet. Um, what I was seeing was that the readership, I mean, what's strange is like a reader that reads, say, Jack Reacher, right? Um, if you co-author a, a novel with, with Lee Child, say, um, I would bet you money that you would see maybe 0.00001% of Child's readership following you over. Oh, wow, really? Huh? Yeah, it just doesn't work the way you would think. Because, you know, my brilliant thought was, oh, I'll write with Clive. You know, he's got millions of, of followers, you know, so some percentage of those will come over and it'll be all good. And um, that's not how it works. And it doesn't work that way for anybody. None of his co-authors. None of, you know, all you have to do is look at their sales. And it just doesn't happen because people see that brand name and that's what they're buying. They're buying the brand. So when they buy, see a James Patterson novel, you know, he uses a lot of co-authors and they put out a book and, you know, I mean, they're ranked number 56,000 or something. Mm -hmm. And yet Patterson's number one for months with the co, because the, the reader simply doesn't recognize that other name. It's like, it's as though it was just, you know, like the publisher's name on it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, Cause I thought for sure you'd be, it'd be like, you know. Kind of like yeah, well, the lottery. <laughs> you and me both. Sure. No, and, and and some of them did, but my point being that yeah. it's not nearly as significant as you would think it would be. Mm -hmm. But you know, having said all that, I mean, it was a wonderful opportunity, and I learned all about working with the trad pub community and with the you know with the with, with Clive's team and working with Clive himself. I mean, come on, I was like 17, 18 years old reading his books, and now I'm writing with him. Yeah, that'd so be amazing. <laughs> it's hard to get any better than that. Yeah. I mean, really, it is. It's like if Ludlum was still alive, that'd be the only other guy. I'd be like, you know, I got to write for this guy. So. And you're still, you're still staying, you're staying indie, right, all the way. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I shop something about once every year, year and a half, just to keep the dialogue open and mm -hmm. see whether anyone wants to bury me in money. But um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm pretty comfortable where I am. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, there's certain types of novels that New York could do a lot if they put their back behind it mm -hmm. to turn into really, you know, breakout hits. But for the average novel, they can't really do much more than 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 I can. So, you know, you really want to give up, you know, you know, four fifths of your royalties for roughly the same sales. Uh, you know, I I don't think that there's a point. So I think there's specific types of novels that um, are worth shopping, and if you can get the right kind of deal, um, you should you should absolutely. Sh um, most of them, most of them, there you wouldn't see any any big sales bump. Let me put it that way. <laughs> And so, no point. And you have several. You have several series out. Do you like write like different ones at at the same time, or do you just focus on one and then move to the next one? Yeah, I just write them one at a time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just I just have a publishing schedule that I just go. Okay, I want to release two books, two jet books this year. I want to start a new series. I want to you know write another one or two Ramsey's books, and that's it. So, you know, I just plug them in and go, okay, maybe a Jet book in the summertime and then around Christmas, you know, maybe a Ramsey's book somewhere in the late spring and in the fall and then the new series, you know, April, May, and June. And if it starts really taking off, then that's what I'll be doing for the rest of the year. That's about as much thought as I give to it. <laughs> and from there, I, you know, I mean, it keeps me focused. Okay, you know, if I'm going to release a book by X, I better start writing it by Y. So, how many miles do you put in the treadmill uh, when you're done writing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I just walk fairly slowly, and I, I probably, you know, when I first, when it was all new and ooh, this is pretty cool, you know, I was walking three hours a day on it. Now I probably clock an hour and a half, which is maybe three miles a day. But that's three miles more than I was getting. Yeah, absolutely. 
So you you find you know I've lost twenty five pounds. Oh so, wow. Yeah. No. No. You you walk three to five miles a day, seven days a week, going from sitting around like a toadstool. You're going to see some changes. So I recommend it. I, I say it's it's probably more important than any writing class you'll ever take. Or, yeah, I mean, invest the money in a a treadmill desk because it will it it's pretty hard to enjoy any success you have if you can't walk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's the problem with the, the sedentary uh, aspect of this business. <laughs> no, and it's you know, and I meet lots of authors, and they. Yeah, I have the same complaint. They're, oh, God, I'm 45 pounds heavier since I started doing this, and uh, my back hurts, and I've, I've got diabetes, and, you know, it's like, well, you know, that's because you don't move. Your body was designed to move, and this job requires you to, it's repetitive motion. You're just sitting there, to, so figure out a way where you're not just sitting there. I mean, to me, that seems obvious. <laughs> so figure out a way that you're not just sitting there, and then, you know, maybe you'll be healthy. Er. <laughs> er. <laughs> healthy er. So how many books do you have planned to publish this year? Hmm, boy, my editor's going to kill me. <laughs> I know, because, you know, she's always like, you know, I've got it, I've got it in writing. You're not <laughs> writing more than X. You know, like, yeah, well, um, I, I was, I was going to write, I was going to release five books this year. That's the truthful answer. And I already had two of them in the can when I walked into the year. So, you know, what is it now? It's February. I'm going to start a new one in about a week and a half, and that's going to be the first in this trilogy, this post-apocalyptic um, trilogy that I sort of came up with the idea for about a month ago. So I'm going to write those three books back-to-back and release them April, May, and June. Cool. And then I'll probably those weren't on the uh, on the agenda, by the way. So those are kind of hmm, I got to figure out how to tell her that's just one <laughs> long book, and, I, and they're divided up into three really convoluted acts. <laughs> it's like a two hundred and twenty thousand page book. You, you can try to sneak it in as one to her. Yeah, it basically as one, so it counts as one. And then you know I've got the, the other two in the can, so I'll probably you know along with those three, I'll probably write. Two or three more besides that. So this will be a slow year. This will be a, a six six book written year. Oh. And for me, that's slow. I've yeah. like every other year I've written up ten. So it's going to sleep. You know, I'm already sort of pacing around going, Geez, what am I going to do with all my time? Well, you have more tequila time, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, come on. I, you know, I'm going to look like a yak. My liver will be so <laughs> swollen. So I'm gonna, yeah, it's, it's probably better that I write another jet book than. Uh, than than just sit on the beach guzzling margaritas all day long. <laughs> Tough decisions. <laughs> no part of that sounds terrible, by the way. Yeah. All right. Well, um, is there anything else you would like to uh, tell our listeners before I let you go? Um. Well, no. Thank you for the support. Number one. I mean, I am shocked and stunned that that folks continue. Um, parting with their money and investing in in my my books. I'm pleased with um, the fact that I have a. a a loyal readership that seems to be willing to consume most of the stuff that I put out. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would say to budding authors, just recognize that, you know, this is, this is probably the hardest work you're ever going to do. And anyone that tells you differently hasn't been doing it very long. Uh, because it's it's nothing in life that's worth doing is easy, and this is worth doing, but it, it ain't easy. Like easy is not a word I would use with 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 being a writer. Yeah, especially that successful uh, as, you, as uh, uh, your type of success level. Well, yeah, because I'm doing it with volume. Yeah. In other words, I'm, I just I, I was very pragmatic when I looked at this. I just went, I want to make X amount of money per year. So I don't care whether I have to write twenty books a year or one book a year. You know, I want to make that much off of, you know, off of my publishing business or it's not worth me doing. So then I just sort of like looked at things and kind of went, all right, to make that level of money, I need to do X. And that's how I, I set up my, my schedule. But now it's just gotten so habit forming. If I'm not writing a book, you know, once every five or six weeks, I literally, you know, feel like I'm completely slacking and I, you know, and like I'll never be able to write a book again. Wow. I mean, that's my that's the great fear is like oh geez what, what if what if those last 50 were a fluke 
<laughs> and, and now I simply don't. I can't write. Yeah. You know, what? A, so so there's this sort of odd narcissistic, you know, paranoid um, delusion that sort of you know wakes you up in the middle of the night, going, "What if you? If that last piece of crap that you're trying to turn into a decent second draft, what if that's the last good thing you ever write, and you simply you can't write anymore? Because I'm sure that happens." So that that's the fear that keeps me sort of producing at a fairly <laughs> driven level. Well, it sure is working, and each you know, and, and each one is all your books are good. So it's like, yeah, it's, oh. it keeps going. So you'll probably have a hundred books in uh, in the next five years, huh? <laughs> well, you know, don't, yeah, my editor will be so annoyed. She really will be. <laughs> she, but I, I think seventy-five to eighty is probably a safe bet. Uh, that's amazing. That is amazing. You're uh, yeah. I have to feel, yeah. Talk about feeling like a slacker. So that's that's what I'm gonna do after this interview. I'm gonna go in and uh, <laughs> start you writing. Know, it's funny because I met with I, I met with an author that you know was just in town for a day or or so, and yeah, I was in town. So I got we got together and we had drinks and everything. And um, you know, he's had some pretty substantial success. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? I mean, seriously, what the. F- it, w- <sighs> You, what do you do all year that you only put out one or two books? I mean, just it, it, tell me how your day goes. You wake up. You, you, what do you do? Yeah. Oh, you don't know. It's life gets in the way. I'm like, okay. When you had a job, did you tell your boss, "Oh, sorry, I can't come in today because life got in the way"? Because no, I'm pretty sure you lost your job at that point. So you know what? what you're putting in, you know, one hour a day. What, what kind of result do you expect? And he was like, yeah. So now he's actually generating more books. So I kind of, well, I, yeah. I shamed him into writing. <laughs> That's good. I'll, I'll have to remember that. When, when I start slacking, I'll, I'll hear you going, what are you, what are you doing all day? No, seriously, that's yeah. what I do to myself. I'm like, you know, do you want to be a writer? Or, you know, like if you want to be an NBA guy or a hockey player, a pro hockey player, do you basically just not put on skates or go near the <laughs> ice 99% of the time? Because yes. pretty sure that's not how it works. So if you want to be a writer, go write. All right, Russell. Well, thank you very much again for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been very nice talking to you about the business and writing and your books. Well, it was great uh, great being on. I hope it uh, helps somebody or oh. at least sells more books. See ya. All right, see ya. Thank you for listening to Meet the Thriller Author, a podcast dedicated to bringing you interviews with authors in the thriller genre. And I'll be posting new interviews on Tuesdays, so stay tuned for that. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can do so on iTunes as well as Stitcher. You can also do it via RSS feed. Uh, You can find that on our website at uh, thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast. I also have a mailing list on there. You can sign up to be notified of new podcasts that way as well. So several ways for you to subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on any episodes. I love hearing from listeners. You can reach me via email at podcast at thrillingreads.com. I'm also on Facebook. You can find me there at facebook.com forward slash meet thriller author. I'd appreciate your likes on that uh, page. Uh, You can uh, also find me on Twitter at Alan Peterson. You can find me there on Twitter. I also encourage you to visit my author website uh, if you're interested in my books. And you can find that at alanpeterson.com.